you were you were high up on the list of people to speak to, particularly with regards to the work that you're doing um, in the areas of uh, emotional quotient, adaptability, some of the leadership development that you do, particularly around mm -hmm. the future, the future of work and what kind of systems we need to be looking at. Um, I'm particularly interested in hearing about that today and also how you build your own personal and emotional map for resilience. Um, let's start with maybe a brief background on uh, where you've come from. I see you've moved from Hong Kong to, to London and what's precipitated some of that move? Oh, uh, the UK is just a, a stopgap between Hong Kong and Singapore, actually. So I'm, I'm moving out of Hong Kong into Singapore. Um, so, so the main precipitation of my move is is uh, I follow my wife around the world. She she's the one with the the, the major corporate role, and and I adapt my life around her, her work and 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 her opportunities. Um, and so I've 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 set up my own practice in a way that I can I can do the kind of the work I do wherever wherever I am in the world. So a lot of it's been out in APAC in the APAC area. So. Um, uh, Greater China, um, India, uh, Australia, uh, Southeast Asia, etc. Um, and I, I'm just here at the moment because of the pandemic in the UK. The pandemic, we haven't been able to travel for X number of years, so I'm taking the opportunity as we transition to to spend some time with the with the family. Mm -hmm. um, the background itself is um, I worked in, I've been working in the consulting space for, for many many years. Initially in uh, organisational communication. So I used to teach uh, cross-cultural skills, soft communication, all of these kind of things, and 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 then moved into doing through through doing a master's degree and, and a PhD. It moved into teaching organisational behaviour, um, very very specifically looking at what high performance looks like in quite toxic transformational organisational environments. Uh, got a role teaching um, leadership at uh, MBA level. Uh, and started doing more and more leadership work because I was so dissatisfied with uh, the content in the leadership programs. It, it it didn't resonate at all with my own research of, of high performance in, in the body of the organisation. So I've spent probably the last seven years uh, really addressing what is the problem in the knowing doing gap in leadership? Why why do we know that there's a problem? Uh, and why are we unable to do anything about it? And, and how would you reimagine leadership, uh, both development and the concept itself, to address the, the current organisational challenges that, that we're talking about? And a lot of that would be what we're talking about in terms of resilience and, and, and emotive behaviours and, and stuff like that. So that's kind of where I am at the moment. And, and a lot of my clients I'm, I'm working in that space with is you recognize as a client that that lots of your potential leaders aren't taking that step into the, the, the level of complexity required to do the work. And we try and help them uh, get a whole bunch of leaders taking that step much more quickly uh, than, than would normally be taken. So that, that's kind of a lot of the work we're doing at the moment. It's a very exciting area and very topical right now. And, and particularly interesting for me is, is what you've just mentioned around the gap. So you noticed there were some uh, deficiencies, I suspect, or at least your model highlighted perhaps a few areas of interest. Can you tell us a bit more about what it was that you, uh, that you feel is lacking or at least could do with more focus uh, in, the, in the workplace today? Just a few high-level hypotheses around your thesis and, and, and how that differs from the existing, as you say, MBA models or the existing curricula out there. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't know when I first started doing this that I was teaching things very differently from everybody else. I mean, you know, you, you, you start doing what you, you think is right. And, and then people who would take my leadership programs would just go, this is unlike any leadership program I, I've ever done before. So the, the, the kind of way I think at a high level, abstract level of, of, of what that looks like is I don't teach models. Mm -hmm. I don't teach uh, competencies and I don't treat, teach any of the strength based stuff, which is the, the classic way of right, I learn this model and, and then learn to lead and, and or, or develop these competencies and become a better leader, whether it's the, the standard competency stuff or the strengths based stuff. I don't do any of that. What I look at, I, I guess mine is a more storytelling approach. I look at the story of leadership, uh, how we have thought about and, and, and how we have behaved as leaders for thousands of years. 
and then talk about that story, how that story is developing into the into the modern context and why, how how past chapters of that story still impact life today, and then how you are creating your own um, story and your own chapter in the leadership. So we're, we're moving in, uh, we're moving away from a, a bunch of embedded stories into something new. And, and so that's kind of what I teach. And so I would then be looking at one of the other reasons that I would be different is I'm not a psychologist. Mm-hmm. And leadership is a, is very much a psycho is, is, is run by psychologists. Um, so they're looking at the inner self and the authentic self and all of this kind of stuff. So I would I'm quite transdisciplinary and I, I I've studied psychology and social psychology and sociology and anthropology plus a bunch of philosophical subdisciplines, etc. Uh, and I take that into leadership development. I say, look, it's not just about the self. It's not just about the inner self. It's about the self and the systems. Uh, and you need to understand both in order to be able to start shaping systems. Yeah. Um, so you understand the, 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 the psychology of leadership. You understand the, 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 the social systems that you're, you're interacting with. You understand power. You understand influence. And you start putting all of this together in a package that you're comfortable with rather than following a model that someone else has designed and says this is what leadership looks like. So that I hope that's high level enough, but that's, that's what I try and do. <laughs> Well, no, and that, that's it's, uh, it's it's particularly fascinating in the sense that um, you speak of, and you know, when one visits your website, uh, you speak of uh, areas of innovation, uh, behavioural innovation, leadership innovation, mm-hmm. uh, and you touch on systems and the complexity of the systems, which is for me an interesting, refreshing take um, uh, with a modern view on. Uh, the complexity involved, uh, the modern leader and the future leaders need to be able to grasp both um, the existing bricks and mortar or the old world uh, and configure themselves for the new world. And, and, and you know, one of the areas that brought uh, you to, to my attention that I really uh, enjoyed, and, and certainly your posts are always interesting, um, was the book Fortitude uh, and one that you mm-hmm. actually inspired me to start reading. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is... You know, you can. I'll, I'll allow you to tell us more about this. But for me, the underpinning sort of reasons behind uh, the book, and uh, you know, it talks about areas of resilience, a big, a big part of certainly what my career has been about, uh, both in work and play and sport, uh, but also um, the uh, the bigger system, the ecosystem that we're a part of that enables us mm-hmm. to build that resilience, particularly around you know the, the insights that we probably about 10 years old now, I'm not sure, but the Harvard study, the 76-year study that, that was published uh, around happiness, which was talking about, uh, you know, the, the single biggest determinant or factor for happiness and a long and healthy, healthy life is our ecosystem of support and, and mm-hmm. the, family, the tribe that you belong to, whether that be a, a, a nuclear family at home or that, whether that be a a, a, a sports team or, or a corporate family. And I think this was, um, this for me really stood out about what it was saying and certainly still um, still advocate uh, and an area that got me thinking, which is why we wanted to speak to, the, to, to today. And, and, you know, I'm going to draw you on a, a bit of some of the thinking behind this and, and your work in terms of resilience. I mean, how, how would you define uh, and we can come back to some of the innovation elements that you work with. I think that's particularly interesting. But, um, it, you know, there's a lot of people right now struggling with uh, adapting to the new normal. Um, some large organizations are figuring out how they move into this new uh, the future. Uh, and a lot of smaller startups and, and, you know, founders have found it very difficult to navigate. Uh, you know, the last couple of years, there's been existential crises um, that have made it very difficult for them. And so I think this message is particularly interesting is how do you, let's start with the def- definition of resilience. So how would you define resilience? Oh, I mean, uh, so it's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big question. So I mean, I mean, I'll, let, let, let's reflect on Bruce Daisley's work, Fortitude, to start with. You know, so there's this notion of, um, uh, he, he's arguing that, that the standard ways we teach resilience in organisations today that, that would emerge out of the positive psychology of Seligman don't actually work at all. Uh, and, and there's something else going on, which is this connectedness between between groups, uh, between people, et cetera, et cetera. So that, this is clear. So, so if you're defining resilience, it's something to do with 
connection within an ecosystem. Um, and, and it's about, I think it's, I don't think I've ever thought through exactly how I would define it, but it's more around that that when that there is inevitable turbulence in an ecosystem, um, and it's as you when when you're dealing with that turbulence, it, it's to stop it breaking you. It, it's it's enables us to sway and to shift and to adapt as this as this turbulent washes over you. Um, so so that that that's where and now this is where Bruce is coming from because Bruce is basically saying it's not teaching someone to to just stand alone like a tree in, in, with all of this turbulence because eventually that tree gets broken by one storm or another. It's about a whole bunch of grass all swaying around and and, and working together as a, 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 un, underpinned by this this deep root system mm. where nothing actually gets harmed by by the winds and, and the turbulence etc. The, 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 the survival is a group level survival. And where where my work comes in at the level of resilience would be how in the body of the organisation, how are people creating these bonded groups that actually keep them resilient in the midst of all the chaos and the confusion of, of, of and the complexity of, of contemporary organisational work? Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that can then take us into what's been going on during the pandemic. Because two two things are happening and why people are struggling about going back to work. So as the initial pandemic, uh, when it kind of happened, we we all found resilience in our local communities. So I was in Hong Kong. Um, we met a whole bunch of parents uh, from my, from my eight year old or then six year old who would have barbecues and meals and all kinds of things together on a regular basis because we couldn't really leave our suburb. Yeah. And we would never have met them. Yeah. You know, so we would we would, would have met them occasionally, maybe at one big event, but would have never have become close. And we did create lots and lots of close relationships. Um, and, and I think we all relied on each other to keep each other going during this. And, and, and they were just a step away. OK, you could call them up and say, do you want to come over for a drink and the barber and the balcony or or something like this? And, and you had this opportunity to go and, 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 and walk to them and, and, and have this this kind of um, network of people that, that were willing to help you. So where I am now, which is on the west coast of the UK, um, the, just, just in front of me is a nature reserve and then, then you've got the beach, the other side of it. And what all the local families did when right at the beginning of COVID is they, they walked into the, there's this big tree in the middle of the wood and they turned it into the magic faraway tree from Enid Blyton's book. And every single family yeah. would add a window on it or a toadstool or a pixie or something so there was this kind of a whole area where there, there where people were doing stuff and looking after each other and waving each, even though they couldn't talk to each other because of the social distancing they were all doing stuff in this local community so we've all experienced that during covid and now we're being asked to go back to the office and what we're being told by those in the office is that this is this kind of community resilience these creative collisions going on in the workplace and most of us are calling bullshit on that mm -hmm. we're first yeah. of all calling bullshit that that didn't exist prior to covid but we're really calling bullshit that this doesn't exist now because most of us want to go back to the office. So you take your hour long commute, you get into the office, you're the only one of your team there. So you spend your entire time on the uh, on Zoom calls. Um, yeah. You then have another hour long commute back home. Uh, and what strips away from you is the fact you don't have any of your neighbours around now to, 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 to break up this, this mundanity of the Zoom calls where you can just have a five minute conversation over the fence or yeah, that's that is stripped away from going back into the office. So, so to, to cycle back into my research. This always went on in what we would call liminal spaces. So the in-between spaces between the formal and the informal. And so you'd always have these bonding activities where, where people were going and were talking about, you know, they, they said this, what do they really mean? And you'd have these kind of conversations over a coffee or a beer or sometimes just going to a side room, some, even examples of people doing it in bathrooms and restrooms, you know, having these kind of conversations. They have been stripped away through the digital transformation of work during COVID. They are, they, they kind of exist in WhatsApp channels and things like that, where people are throwing jokes and right. bonding mechanisms in it. But they've actually gone because we, everything is formalised. All the Zoom meetings are formal Zoom meetings. You don't have these little five minute in-betweens where you're transitioning from one meeting to another and you're bonding with someone saying, what, you know, do they really want us to do that? What do you think was going on? 
yeah. that's all disappeared. And what until we until we re-inject that into the work, resilience is, is going to be a problem because nobody's actually doing this, the, the the collective sense making or the communal sense making to 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 to, to hold or holding each other's hands in the way they 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 theoretically did anyway. I mean, I think this 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 they were people are also calling bullshit. Of, of what happened before the pandemic because they've actually realized in their local communities what connection and resilience actually looks like yeah. and they're recognizing how in the workplace it was it was a theory of resilience but it wasn't actually a, a, an actuality of resilience so i love that it's such a rich territory and i wonder whether this is not just about resilience um for me the, the, the there's a big question mark at the moment around people also feeling motivated to to do the work that they used to do. Uh, it might be post-pandemic that they had to reevaluate life priorities and they may have lost people uh, in the process. Um, uh, you know, the, the word purpose comes up a lot. Uh, and, you know, some people try and reframe purpose in many ways. What's your take on that? I mean, how much does purpose and and the type of work, the meaning in that we derive from work, how much of that is at play here? Um, so the notion of organisational purpose is something I really struggle with. Um, so one one of the things that, that's been going on in, in, in the literature, it would be called the postmodern horror. And this is the idea that all our traditional institutions, so family, church, local community, have fragmented and disintegrated. So there's no purpose and meaning in, in that part of our life. And, and then again, perhaps during COVID, we found that again. Yeah. Briefly. Yeah. And so where where our purpose is now being uh, considered is work, OK, organisational purpose. So the, the, the purpose of your work and the purpose of the organisation is something you're supposed to fully align with and, and, and do that work. Yeah. Um, and this is what what the, the researchers would call the postmodern horror, because the organisation, you know, you're supposed to love the organisation and give your entire self and purpose to the organisation. It's not going to give that back to you. Yeah. So, so your purpose, you're, you're outsourcing your purpose to, to something that is not willing to do, to do any community work in return. Yeah. And that is, that's really dangerous for people because they, they, they do all of that, that work and they find all of the purpose in their job and nothing in other aspects of life. Um, then if that job disappears, which it can easily do with the downsizing and the furloughing and the economy, et cetera, et cetera, they're left with nothing. And, and, and then you've got this kind of existential angst as, as, as who am I and what, what am I supposed to be doing and, and what, what about the rest of my life? So I, I have a, a challenge with single dimensional organisational purpose. I don't have a challenge with multidimensional purpose where or purposes where, where you're doing many things in your life that give you meaning and purpose. So I think we found that again during the pandemic briefly. Yeah. Um, and we're being asked to give it up. Uh huh. That's a very bad organizational purpose. And I think that's the part of the resistance. So fascinating. And so, I mean, the reality is that, you know, large organizations still exist. And, you know, one of the challenges that we find is that, you know, many, you know, would be critical of the organization, but there are still some roles where large organizations can have impact. And for me, the question here to you is, what can what can an organization, these these large organisms do? to make that work more meaningful, to create more uh, community in the workplace, or at least emulate some of what we've experienced post COVID uh, at home and in our, you know, our, our resilient communities? Well, I mean, that, that's the trillion dollar question because they, they, um, they don't really know how to do it at the moment. So, I mean, again, we, we, uh, when you go into the organisation, there has to be energy there. So I think talk, thinking about the concept of energy is, is really important. So, so if you're going into the organisation and then you're just doing sitting on computers and, and typing and, and doing the stuff that you can do by yourself uh, and nobody talks to you, um, that is not an energizing. That's a, that, that's actually sucking energy out of you. So uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Becky Andre, she talks about. Um, Sorry, I'm taking these off. They're not working. Apologies. Uh, she talks about um, she talks about high quality connections. Um, so so this notion is when you're in the organization, the, the 
the con levels of connection that you should have should be high quality. So you're you're being energized by them. The, the, the person you're talking to is being energized about by them. And a lot of the chatter I'm hearing around how organizations are coping with hybrid is around this notion of designing designing the, the, the work and designing the space to enable the, these kind of high quality connections and these energizing moments. Yeah. Um, the practice of doing that, you know, so, so the corporate real estate guys I work with, they're, they're really quite interested in this. I mean, a workplace strategy and, and, and how do you how do you create this this level of energy? But I've also heard stories of people, of, of managers, like old school traditionalists walking around the office and people having a cup of coffee, coffee <laughs> together saying, get back to work, get back to your desk, because they <laughs> only perceive work as being on the computer. Uh, you know, they don't perceive this energizing kind of stuff as actual work. So I, I, I regularly draw upon um, the MIT research to try and explain this to clients, which is this... The, the work for uh, call centers in banks uh, from Alec, Alec Pentland. And, and they looked at that. Historically, uh, a, call, a, a team in a call center would uh, all have their coffee and their lunch individually because they all had to cover the phones, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, and Pentland just experimented by, by giving them all a lunch break and coffee break around a big dining table together. Uh, and they would chat over the dining table about each other. They'd all get to know each other better because even though they were the same team, they hadn't actually heard each other's stories, so they got to know each other. But they also started talking about the work. So what you find is one person has solved the challenge in a way that somebody else is really struggling with, and they, they hear it over the chatter at the table, and they start to uh, apply those fixes to their own work. And so what, what they found was that, that the overall productivity of this team started going up and up and up and up and up. What, so they got quicker at answering calls. They, they they had a higher level of customer satisfaction. They had lower levels of job turnover, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they had to have these these communal moments and so a communal coffee, uh, communal lunch, and another kind, of, another kind of communal tea in the afternoon where they 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 got to do this this high energizing, high quality connection work on a regular basis. So that that's kind of the. At the core of it, that's just one example. But how do you do that at a, an organizational level is, is the big question. I don't think anyone has solved it yet. Mm -hmm. I think there are some really interesting um, interesting ideas emerging about how we might solve it um, within the, the organizational design stuff. The big challenge and, and the kind of work I do is how do you get leaders and managers to actually understand that this is what good work looks like when they've been trained to think that good work looks like something completely different. Yeah. Uh, and that's there's the second some, layer of this. Surely there's, thank you, there's some outliers that are already doing this well. Have you seen any? Oh yeah, there are. I mean, yeah, there, there are definitely outliers doing doing this well. And when we we work with 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 a number of companies that are really uh, wrestling with this and, and and trying to create these these energizing moments. Um, so certainly a, a client I've worked with recently. I mean, they they, but this is this these are pockets within the client. Yeah. So they they have a pocket in in a in APAC that is doing it extremely well, but they're Americas and they're EMEA equivalents are really struggling okay so there's this there's something going on that one specific leader stroke manager has done in order to create these conditions yeah but it hasn't been mirrored at the systemic level across the organization so i see pockets of, of success but i don't see systemic pockets of, of, of or systemic success at the moment this is a fascinating area for, for, you know and and you know part of me thinks that perhaps over the last five or six years since well, 2016 perhaps seven years we've it, the the Americas the UK Europe to a certain extent and some other parts of the world have uh, have gone through transitions in a way that you know we've seen the increase of this mental health pandemic that's affecting people, whether that's at home or in the workplace. Uh, to what extent do you think that is impacting this cultural nuance that, 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 that makes it harder for some in some countries to adopt this new way of working and some of these, uh, you know, these optimized ways of, uh, of future models? versus other cultural is there a cultural nuance even i so what i think is going on so so in a again most of my work is in apac and, and apac doesn't have the um 
the unified way of working that perhaps America and, and, and Europe has. Okay, so this is this is one level is if you're working in APAC, you've got 16, 20 different countries all working in very different ways, and you're having to adapt yourself to work out what, what is going on, which which lots of Western organizations struggle with because they want it all to be aligned and unified and everybody doing the same thing. But actually, because you've got these cultural nuances going on and, and, and diversities going on in, in, in APAC naturally. Yeah. Um, there, there's some really interesting energies coming out of, of, of the APAC system. So that, that's one of the things I think is going on. And so that's why it's easier to tap into a multiplicity of perspective there and, and different ideas than perhaps it would be in the West. Another aspect in the West, and some of the, some of the chats I've had with HR, heads of HR and APAC and why they wouldn't go back to, to Europe or the Americas, is the relative lack of antagonism between the employer-employee relationship in, in, mm. in East Asia compared to the West. So there are loads of historical reasons for that, um, but they don't seem to exist in the same way in, in East Asia and Southeast Asia and as they do in, in, in Europe and America. So that, that antagonism is that we are fighting for, for you know, management versus not employee. We're, we're kind of fighting for our rights and our, uh, and, and our you know, we're fight, we're fighting for our lives room. almost and, and, and how we create value. That's missing in, in the East, which allows the, the kind of discourses and, and, and the, the ideas to, to merge a little bit more, more easily. So, so one, of, one of the challenges is, and, and, and you know, the, the, this is a big paradox that's going on in organisational life at the moment, is, is, is nearly every client I work with now is, is saying, on one hand, they want to have uh, agility, and diversity and all of this kind of stuff. And the other side, they say we want oneness and unity. And you go, well, okay, they're, they're different things. <laughs> you know, you, you you can't have, you know, you've got that you want this one, you know, every company is now one this or one that and the unity and this kind of, and then they're going agility and diversity and inclusion. You're going, okay, this really interesting to work with because the paradox is where the value is. But they don't even they don't see the paradox up front. They don't see that they're two different concepts that, that can't coexist. So the way we try and work with them is so that what you're, you're going to get, what you're looking to is you don't want the uniformity. Okay? You, don't, you don't want the uniformity that tends to occur in the West now. And, and this, this everybody thinks the same way, everyone acts the same way, everyone dresses the same way, everyone's aligned. But you don't want that uniformity. What you want is unity out of diversity. So you want to have all of these diverse these diverse opinions and diverse ways of working, but understanding that there's there's a, a, a unit that there's a unity in, in going forward. So I, I think, and again, I'm, I'm only talking, I haven't done much work in the West for, for the last three years for, for obvious reasons. Um, I think there's a lack that there's something missing in the way the West is thinking about organisations that, that, that East Asia and Southeast Asia is, is still exp is experiencing. So I, I actually think a lot of the solutions to current challenges are going to be coming out of tapping into the dynamic diversity of, uh, in, in the East Asia and Southeast Asia and bringing that back to Western and, and, and American kind of or European and American organisations because for me that's where, that's where the energy is at the moment. Yeah, I love that. I love. I mean, I I recently I've been doing a lot of work in Amsterdam, and for me, that's an example of probably an atypical situation in the West, where there is a lot of diversity. Uh, there is still some at 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 large organizational level. There is there's a lot of unity and the the dynamic you've just described that afflicts the West. However, there is also a lot of diversity in. Uh, the bottom-up approach to work. And so, you know, you go into the retail uh, estates, you go into the high streets, there's, 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 there's fewer chains, there's fewer mm -hmm. sort of top-down structures. Uh, the models that we see are a little bit more grassroots and, and bottom-up. Um, a lot of design thinking, which again stems from that diversity uh, and, and cognitive uh, sort of uh, uh, diversity is effectively what I'm trying to say. So this, th there are some pockets, but as you say, it's really interesting that, that APAC is is one to watch, and you know APAC is also interestingly doing very well. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's the future darling uh, of of the globe, and and one to watch. My question to you goes back to uh, another another area in which a lot of businesses are grappling now are around is around um, the role of hybrid. In the workplace i know you've done quite a bit of work on this so the, the hybrid workplace or the workplace of the future you know many businesses are um uh, are 
actually starting to talk about do we bring people in do we do we sort of dictate that they come back in um what you've described and what you're touching on is really not so much about the uh you know whether they're doing work online or offline uh, to a certain extent you can't really have those informal conversations if you're sitting at home mm-hmm. um you know most of the informal conversations around the you know the, the water co- water cooler and, and lunch is what creates that that almost mystical powerful connection but with you know where would you say in 10 years time the world would have moved and you know if you had no crystal ball here you you're making a prediction are we moving back into physical spaces where we're working together or is it that we're just thinking uh, thinking better or thinking harder around how we bring some of these almost human mystical organism elements into the work that we do so I don't think we're going to go back to everybody working in the office. I mean, uh, there, there's I'm not saying that, but there, there's a clear fight going on. So this, this is one of the big challenges: is that if we don't repopulate the cities and the offices, then there's going to be a massive financial crash because you, there's so much money in the pension money and the hedge fund money invested into corporate real estate that there's going to be a, a a real challenge. So so there's got to be a balance in in, in maintaining the, the the wider social system. We can't all just be atomistic. I don't want to go into the office because right. I, you know there, there's there's actually reasons for for these these systems to exist that that actually that the whole of society relies eyes on um so there's you've got to have that at, at the underlying base that that we can't just give all of this up yeah. um the challenge i think is that, that nobody nobody's thinking about this the right way so the, the the right way for me is is thinking about the work itself and and and, and how the work itself creates value and how much value the work itself creates and there there, there seems to be some and again i'm still struggling my way through how to articulate this but there seems to be three levels of work that that create different levels of value so you you call it individual work and and then collective or teamwork and and then systems level work and they all create uh, different layers of value and we all we have to be good at all three of them and so the individual level work, which you know most people are thinking about most of the time, is is uh, I'm sitting at you know this is what you're doing by yourself at home, you know sitting on the computer and doing whatever you're doing. And there are two types of work here. There is the, the deep work, which is I'm not being distracted and I'm really focused and concentrated, and then the shallow work, which is I'm I'm being deeply distracted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now we know that this is very established research as to how do you how how much more value does a a person doing this kind of work add uh, if they're not distracted and they're working in a nice space and, and you know the big big area they can turn off all of their um, notifications they can, they can get rid of the interruptions and they can spread yeah. and and you know there, there's a, gr- a massive likelihood that people who have that kind of space are in the top uh, quartile of performance adding in, in the kind of deep work they do and then you've got kind of yeah, you've got the, the best are kind of two and a half times more productive than the, the average and, and seven and, and ten times more productive than the worst because it's kind of a, a long tail of poor performance. But it's the space that and, and how you man- control the space that seems to create the value. Now, whether that means that the space attracts high performing people or high performance occurs because of the space, nobody knows. Yeah. But But some kind of control over your individual space equals a high level of individual productivity or performance but it's only two and a half times better than the mean when you go into the team level stuff we're now talking about 10 times better than than the mean so a good team you're multiplying the the productivity or the performative or the value add by by four Mm. versus the average and so that requires informal and formal connectivity so so formal collaboration so design thinking was one way you talk about i'm a big fan of liberating structures as a way of doing this but you, you need to know how to sort through challenges and problems and work out who's doing what and there's a whole bunch of techniques but you need to get people in a room and meeting together and high energy and all of this kind of stuff and then the stuff we talked about the, the, the connection uh, breaking bread together, having coffee together, having these kind of uh, relationship and, and, and trust and relationship building exercises, and that seems to create these high performing teams where there's a like a, t- a multiple level of, of, of value add. The systems level stuff, and this is where the real challenge comes in, is around 
it seems to be around how individual learning ripples into organizational learning. So if somebody sees the challenge with the problem with the system and solves it, how does that get across the organization, the whole system of the organization? And then there's something around systemic well-being so that everybody can apply all of their intelligence and can bring, you know, they're not shattered all the time, they're not exhausted, they're constantly able to bring themselves and, and, and the best of themselves into the work, into doing the work. Mm-hmm. So you've got systems level well-being and you've got kind of systems level learning. Uh, I don't see anyone doing that well at the moment. I see I see attractions to it. Mm. You know, you're, you're hearing more and more organisations saying, you know, what we're having to develop our people better. We have to do more learning. We have to do this kind of, and of course, the well-being uh, resilience discourse is everywhere. Yeah. But I see most of it as sticking plasters at the moment. Yeah. Now, what what the literature says is, if you get this right, you are probably moving fifty to hundred times faster than your competitors. But I don't see anybody getting it right. And so everyone's just doing the same thing. So what part of the work we try and do is, is, is just try to push people into saying, well, especially traditional managers, if your people are well and if they are learning the whole time and if you're communicating this, if you're creating a systems level of this, the, the, the chances are you're going to be in control of the tempo in a way that your competitors aren't Mm -hmm. and control over the tempo. A, you're moving faster, but B, you're forcing them to move faster and they're not ready for it. And that actually can cause them all kinds of challenges. So it's kind of where where we situate the work. But I I would be dishonest to say that I know all the answers to that learning and the well-being stuff, but we are doing work that I think is pushing that forward. Fantastic. Well, I think that feels like a very good place to to end uh, today's call. Um, I've really loved listening to you. I mean, if anyone wants to hear more, where do they go? How do they find uh, find you? Uh, well, so so I mean, my LinkedIn profile is is clearly uh, there, and I write a lot on LinkedIn. Depending on how much other work I've got on, some weeks I'm very quiet, other weeks I write a lot. Uh, EQLab.co is the website, um, so we we put our longer form articles on on those websites uh, on that website. They're they're the two classic ways to to get hold of me. Fantastic, Richard. Thank you ever so much. I've really loved speaking to you, and uh, hopefully we'll do this again soon. Great. Thank you, Andrew.